first. Of course, would show Hello, director here. Oh, Mr. Jaffe, who I think is on an airplane right now. Okay, we had a closed session and uh, we got some information about that. Um, okay, no public hearing, and we have uh, seven items on the consent agenda. Anything anyone yeah. wants to pull? Yes, uh, I just had a couple of comments on uh, 3.7. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to pull something, but I, one of the things we should probably talk about at some point is the. Oh, what's the name of that property over there? It's near the. Uh, oh, one of the surplus properties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see. It's on here. Now, you want to sit here so you can write it. Suncatcher Court. Okay. And it's a actually a residential piece of property, and we had thought at one point about putting a well on it, and we never did. So it's just sitting there. So, you want that one brought back? No, just for staff to consider. Okay. Okay. I think that we have no plans for it. It would be a nice, easy property to sell because it's just yeah you know, residential area. Well, okay. I'll, I'll move approval of the. Other consent agenda items, 3.1 through 3.6. Okay. I'll second it. Come on. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Right. I'm sorry. One item. Thank you. So this is the time for comment on consent agenda items? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos and am a customer of a pure, pure source water company. Um, I have noted that there's been a change in the minutes that it no longer reflects any public comment at all. Your minutes used to. 
And so I would like to ask that, again, you include at least that the public was there and what they had to say. Um, I would also like to say that um, on item 3.3, .3, the reporting of excess real property, that um, the district still holds property to create a reservoir on Glenwood. Yeah, it's and listed. Sorry? It's listed as excess. Yes, I see that. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make that uh, of note to those who are listening, that you do still retain land to create a reservoir. Um, item 3.7. Um, that one's going to be discussed off the agenda. Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead and give your comment. All right, thank you. I'll wait and comment on it then. Item 3.4 then, uh, the water capacity fee. I just want to um, point out that this is a sizable amount of uh, money that has been collected in uh, water capacity fees. And um, I actually had a question about one specific one, I'm sorry. Well, um, so public can request it. Well, that's all right. Um, so I, I want to clarify that the water capacity fees were increased in 2010. I've never seen this information compiled in this way before, so thank you. It's very helpful. Uh, the water capacity fees were raised in 2010. Is that what I'm seeing in the pattern? And um, I also had a question in the water capacity fees. Uh, the one stated for Terramar Retail Centers, it says there are two, but they are only charged for the price of one. So I'd like some clarification on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I think we have a motion and a second. All Aye. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. So we go to 3-7. What's on tap? Um, I had just a couple of small things on the second page of the What's on Tap newsletter. I think it's really, it's good overall. On the first column near the very bottom, near the bottom, it's just mentioning, it's explaining how the fees are determined. And there is, uh, it says, um, let's see. Okay, so it, it's the costs are dri they're driven by the number of service connections, not by how much water is used. And I didn't know if we should clarify that other than, you know, electricity and pumping costs. Just, just so that do that's the only thing that goes mm -hmm. up and down with use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the then for on variable costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the on the graphic, yeah. I just. I don't want to have a plastic straw on there, sorry. <laughs> there was okay. a comment about that already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so That's it's, all it's, I have. It's gone. Okay. Anyone else have anything on the what's on tap? Start the clock anew, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I do. Um, understand that the what's on tap only comes out quarterly. So another what's on tap will not come out until March or so. So I'm, I'm curious why there's no mention in here. Um, I, I really like that you explained the financing of water um, and the rates, but there's no mention of the public hearing that I think your board has put on your February agenda um, to discuss rate increases publicly. I think that should be included in here. And also there's no mention that your board is considering a 9% per year increase for a considerable number of years to pay for the Pure Water SoCal project. Um, I also see that there's no talk about the Granite Way well, which is um, a significant project, a very visible project, v Granite Way. Granite Way Well, I don't know what I said, but that's what I meant to say, Granite Way Well. And that's a very visible project. And uh, your newest well, and it seems like uh, your uh, ratepayers would be very interested in the progress of that since there's been no activity for almost, um, almost two years there since you drilled it. So um, I'd like to 
include those into your what's on tap going out soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any things about this no. document? Okay. See, I think that's just informational, so we don't it need is. to approve it. So we go on now to the oral communication. So this is the time to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda. I should just leave my chair here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Becky Steinbruner, again. Um, I just want to say congratulations. And I know this is kind of on the, the agenda tonight, but the uh, water transfers began yesterday. And I want to thank uh, General Manager Duncan for inviting me and some of the other folks from Water for Santa Cruz to attend that really great event that was a happy moment so thank you and uh, there's a really nice article in the sentinel about it today um, i i do also want to point out that in the aptos times and the capitola soquel times uh, chairman daniel you had a um, an article about water progress and you urged people to be myth busters <laughs> when they hear people saying there's you just said sewage water, but often we we use the term treated sewage water. So I would ask when you ask people to be myth busters to really include a good source of information where they can go to to read. And um, I always go to your Corolo engineering study that was presented uh, as a result of the study of the uh, contaminants in in. Um, the Santa Cruz waste treatment and was extrapolated also from the San Luis Obispo area. And that I remember that it was not possible to get all of the, um, uh, some of the pharmaceuticals out and some of the uh, contaminants created by disinfection like NDMA. And again, to point out that there are no drinking water standards for pharmaceuticals. Um, again, I will tell you that I am very concerned about the district's plan to inject this treated sewage water, advanced water purification, but it's treated sewage water, into the drinking water supply for the entire area. And again, I want to ask you to let people vote on this. A lot of people have straws in this aquifer. It's not just Soquel Creek, and we need to be given a voice in this too. Um, finally, um, Friday, I had uh, the very good fortune of being given some money so I could attend the State of the Region event put on and seaside by the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I attended the session on housing and water and was quite distressed to see the uh, arena numbers the, that will be enforced by the state. And if they, the county, the cities do not meet those arena numbers with new legislation coming through, SB 35, um, others, uh, they will be penalized. And there was discussion about Soquel Creek Water District and the very high rates that you charge for ADUs. And so I think you're going to be hearing a lot about that. And um, there are big plans for development in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? No one. We continue. So we go to item 5.1 under reports, the board planning calendar. Yes. The live stream isn't working. I don't know if we want to take a recess until we troubleshoot that, or should we um, just our live stream? I've been informed uh, that televises out to the public. Uh, is is it working? No. We're now live. Okay, so we're back live. Good. So great. Good. So I'll continue on with. Um, Item 5.1, the board planning calendar. Uh, I'll just make note of a couple things. There's two standing committee meetings on Tuesday, the Tuesday coming up a week from today, December 11th, uh, public outreach at 1030, and the water resource um, uh, and infrastructure at 4 to 5. And then the next day on the 12th is the groundwater sustainability plan advisory committee meeting. And I specifically point that out because it's at a different, it's a week earlier than we normally have it. And I know uh, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Jaffe usually, he's our representative on that, and some of y'all uh, also attend. And that'll be at Simpkins uh, next Wednesday, a week from tomorrow, from 5 to 8.30. And they're going to, we're basically, get, at least the rough agenda is, is, is centered around um, uh, management uh, efforts in the aromas. So we'll have uh, Brian Lockwood, the general manager from uh, P PB Water there. And discussion about the differences between the aromas and the uh, Prisma aquifers and how that how this is impacting or could impact the, the groundwater S sustainability plan gsp okay that's it okay any questions public yep. <coughs> okay so that means we're done with the reports we go into administrative business we have 6.1 conditional and unconditional will serve letters i'm available to answer any questions if you have any any questions Looks like none. Anyone want to make any motions? Yep. I'll move approval of both. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I oppose. So it passes three to one. Okay, we go to 6.2, the annual election of vice president by the board of directors. And here's your new president. So take it away, Mr. President. Oh, do we do that right now? That's what we usually do. Okay. So you're it. In fact, the next item has you sign it as the president. All right. I'm good with, um, we're fine. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm, I feel like we've really done a lot of good work this year, and I want to thank you for all your hard work. You've really um, well, it's amazing. been everywhere and trying to be informed on everything. So It's amazing because when I started, you may remember I said, the one thing I want to accomplish is to get an EIR done, and we're yeah. darn close to it. Darn close. Um, and I, I, for one, would like to nominate you for vice president. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna do that. I was, but I'll be happy to second it. Okay. Anybody yeah. else? What you want me to third it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, any other? Okay. You could nominate yourself, even. I guess. Right. I just was waiting to listen. Okay. Um, and um, any public comment on this item? I'm sorry, Becky Steinberg, I'm a little confused. Did you just nominate Dr. Daniels? Daniels? I would like to point out to your board that year before last, you agreed. I, I really like the job Chairman Daniels does. But your board discussed year before last that you would change it up. Well, he's the chairman now. I've mentioned I know. that at the beginning. But, but what I'm seeing is that it's just you two going back and forth. Your board said, year before last, you would change that up and you would bring on somebody else from the board when the position came up. So I want to point that out to you and suggest that you consider instead Director Christensen or Director Lather or Director Jaffe because that's what your board said you would do a couple of years ago. I just want to point that out. I remember it clearly. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Mm -hmm. There's been a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, so we move on to item 6.3. Did John come tonight? Um, he is at home watching online. Okay. <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you. <laughs> uh, yes, I certainly appreciate John. He's um, been uh, working for us for 10 years. Um, he started as a water systems operator and quickly promoted to our electrical technician in 2008. And um, uh, now he was promoted to operations supervisor in 2010. And he's been instrumental in um, our plant startups and keeping the water in the pipes these past 10 years. Um, we're really lucky to have someone with his skill set and combination of common sense and sense of humor. So um, I'm going to miss him. He retires at the end of this year. Um, and uh, we have a resolution uh, for you to vote on. Yes, it's quite a well done resolution. Um, and I, I, I would you like me to read it? I would. I would like to read it to John. Okay. Um, so. 
the Board of Directors of the Soquel Creek Water District at its December 4th, 2018 meeting made the following findings. Whereas John came to the district in 2008 after many years as an automotive mechanic and power generation technician and rose through the district ranks, including water systems operator, electrical technician, and finally operations supervisor in 2010. And whereas John takes the responsibility of a supervisor and operator to the highest professional level, always excelling on state exams and maintains a grade three treatment and distribution operator certification, and whereas John is an extremely gifted water operator and electrical mechanical diagnostician, and whereas John was instrumental in the startup of new district facilities, including the polo grounds and the O'Neill Ranch wells and water treatment plants, the McGregor and Aptos pump stations, the Aptos Junior High replacement well, the Seascape well improvements, the service area three to four intertie, and countless well and plant rehabilitations, and pump and motor repair and replacements, and whereas John taught himself to program the district's supervisory control and data acquisition or SCADA system, significantly increased functionality of the system and added all the new district facilities to the system, allowing remote control. And whereas John also taught himself to be a diagnostic radio frequency technician, greatly improved the district's radio communications by extending the network ranges using tail end links and guided the change of radio frequencies. And whereas John truly cares about providing the highest quality of water, meticulously disinfecting and testing facilities over and above requirements and never experiencing a water quality violation under his watch. And whereas John continuously find ways to save the district money, maintains good relationships with neighbors of district facilities and has compassion for district customers. And whereas John looks out for the safety of others and exercises leadership in addressing electrical safety, including arc flash with one-on-one -on -one coaching. And whereas John is respected by his peers at other agencies, successfully collaborating and working towards common solutions during emergencies as well as longer term projects. And whereas John's total dedication to the district is exemplified by his availability to all staff, day or night, weekends or holidays, to respond to emergencies to keep customers in water or simply answer questions. And whereas John fosters an atmosphere of sharing and learning, is a respected supervisor, and his warmth and humor touches all departments of the district. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Board of Directors of the Soquel Creek Water District that John Henderson is hereby recognized for his dedication and many contributions to the district and leaving the district a better place. And be it further resolved that we all join in extending our appreciation for his loyalty, professionalism, and years of service and wish him a very long, rewarding, and well-deserved retirement. I'll make the motion. <laughs> I'll second it. And thank you, John. Thank I you. Yes, a thank good you. example for all our employees. And, and uh, so I'm proud of this, uh, this, this whole group, but that kind of work ethic is amazing. Yeah, it is. So um, all in favor? Uh, roll call. Oh, it was roll, roll call. call. It's, it's a, a resolution. resolution. So sorry. Okay. Uh, Director Lather? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Luthier? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All righty. Going to be tough to replace. Yeah. <laughs> but we have some other great folks. All right. Um, item 6.4 is approve the lease with easement options, option agreement with Twin Lakes. Yes, yeah, so before you tonight is uh, a lease with a draft uh, easement option pending uh, uh, CEQA analysis for the uh, easement portion. Uh, and it's for a, a district pilot uh, well at the Twin Lakes Church. Uh, it's fully, it's funded by the California State Prop 1 grant funding. And, you know, the I just like to say, put a, sh a shout out for the church, you know, when we came to them and said, hey, we're doing this project. Uh, they just basically said, we want to try to do what's right for the community, and uh, so we want to work with you on, uh, uh, you know, getting a well here. So that's where we're at, and you can see there's a signed agreement on their behalf, and uh, the motion before you tonight is uh, by motion direct the board president to sign the lease agreement um, 
uh, and uh, with the easement option, draft easement option shown in attachment one. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Clear to me. All right. Um, any members of the public wish to speak on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I have a question. On page 70, it talks about the, um, the sale of the easement price. It said the purchase price of the easement paid in annual payment shall be based on an appraisal and shall include providing a credit for water for a demonstration irrigation project as described in section 12A. In section 12A, it says the district shall provide a water credit to Twin Lakes for a demonstration irrigation project for their main athletic field installed and maintained by Twin Lakes in an amount not to exceed three and a half acre feet annually for the duration of the easement period, which is 50 years, as I understand it, provided that the district has not canceled the easement. It also goes on in, um, and, and the intention is to provide purified water for this demonstration project. That's an expensive water to be using for the athletic field. Um, but if the purified water doesn't come to fruition, then you would use potable water. In section 12B, it says in recognition for the groundwater benefits this well, recharge well would do, um, and to address the future possible plans by Twin Lakes to expand their on-site employee housing, the district agrees not to require a water demand offset payment or the equivalent charge, provided the expansion does not exceed 1,600 square feet and is attached to a, an existing single family residence or an attached or detached ADU. So can you tell me how much this is potentially going to be? What is this easement costing for 50 years to agree to pay for 3.5 acre feet a year free water and no uh, water demand offset uh, for uh, expansion of employee housing? Um, and using taxpayer money, Prop 1 money, to do this project. I, I think we need some clarification perhaps from Mr. Basso if this, is, uh, if this is all transparent and proper use of taxpayer money, if it is fair to your other customers to pre be uh, paying uh, carte blanche uh, for this amount of water for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Anybody? I'll make the motion to approve. I'll second it. Seconded by Director Christensen. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Motion carries unanimously. We shall move to the next item, which is coming right along here. Jelly, can you switch? 6.5, I know Six that. Oh, we're going to switch over there. Oh, long. It's okay. All right. So, community water plan update. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give a short presentation on an overview and status update on the water supply options within the community water plan. We also have Anoop Shaw from Brown and Caldwell who has done some analysis related to the costs of the water supply options. So tonight we plan to spend about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes on a short presentation to give a little bit of history and context related to the community water plan, how it was developed. Um, really, I think this is a nice story just in itself of the two handouts that we created in 2015. We did mail this out to all of our customers and last year we did update that and send out a small hand handset. We do provide a lot of updates regularly to the board as well as to our standing committee, the water infrastructure committee as well as the outreach committee, but tonight's presentation and staff memo um, really is to serve as more of a condensed summarized version. Uh, we also want to always recognize that without the input from the community, um, that was kind of what created this whole long-term roadmap was the input we got from the community 
during the year-long process and continuing over the years. We also uh, want to recognize that the community water plan is guided and founded upon some guiding principles that the board set for us in 2017, and we continue to look at those. Um, and then we'll go into more details related to the water supply options. So first off, again, I think we all know that um, about five years ago when we were pursuing the desalination project as our water supply solution to address the critical overdraft and the uh, seawater intrusion of the Mid-County area, that project was put on hold and the district had to embark in a year-long process starting in 2013 and going through most of 2014 um, that really did pave the way for the community water plan. Um, during that time, we had over 13 uh, public meetings, we had workshops, we did both phone surveys as well as online surveys, and it has created that road map that's multifaceted that doesn't just address the water supply solutions, but it also encompasses first, I think, the cornerstone, which has always been and continues to be water conservation, as well as our adaptive groundwater management. And then in terms of the water supply options, rather than um, select a project, one sole project at that time, concluding with that process in 2014, the board did ask staff to continue evaluating multiple supply options at, at various uh, timeliness and tracks. Um, the Pure Water Soquel project at that time was advanced purification for groundwater replenishment, water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz, desalination um, with the Moss Landing Endeavor, and then in 2017, um, we added stormwater capture. So I, I like to go back to um, that time when we were really developing the community water plan and seeking input from the community. We asked them, don't get stuck on a project, and I think that's been um, Ron's mantra over the last few years. It's not about a project, it's about sustainability. And we posed that, we posed a question very similar to that to our community when we were developing the community water plan is what do you value? Everybody has a particular bias or interest on one project or another, but really at the end of the day, what do you value um, and what is important to you? And these were the qualities reliability, is the water available year round even in times of drought? Quality, produces quali water that meets or exceeds local, state, and federal water quality requirements. Timeliness, ability to build the project in a timely manner before seawater intrusion worsens. Um, that one was very important to um, customers at the time because they had just spent the seven years or, or we, the district had spent about seven years with the desal project that was you know, somewhat uh, uh, lost in times of the ability. And, and I think it's become even more relevant since the uh, Danish SkyTem work were offshore. They used the geophysical technique to identify the location of the seawater front, uh, seawater intrusion front where it's not already on shore. And that data revealed that it's right at the shore. So it's the worst case analysis. So. Um, very timely in itself to tell us that we need to get a project in a timely manner. Thank you, Ron. Also, the environment to be have minimal or minimize environmental impacts, scalability, ability to expand or scale operations to adjust to changing needs and climate change, and also affordable or affordability. Does the project have the potential to share costs with other agencies or receive grant funding? Um, in January of 2017, so this was about two years following the uh, approval and adoption of the community water plan, the board set some guiding principles to ensure that we were continually in alignment in terms of what the work that staff was doing, what was the policy directions of the board, as well as what kind of input we were receiving from the community. So that was a document that was adopted and approved in 2017, and I and it was a, it's a multi-page document. Um, but I, what I have here is just sharing some of the guiding principles um, that were identified from the board. Um, in 2014, the board established the eight-year goal to develop a supplemental water supply to be brought online and producing water by 2022. I think from the get-go, and it continues to be to this day, that that is a goal that we are striving to do. The district's long-term sustainability goals are to reduce uncertainty where possible and manage it to 
manage it when it is present and reduce risk through conservation efforts and pursuing obtaining supplemental supplies to eliminate the negative consequence of seawater intrusion. Also actively pursue grants and low interest loans to reduce the local funding needed and offset ratepayer exposure to costs. Specifically, I pulled out these two um, because I think given the nature of where um, some of the water supply projects that are currently underway, the first one is on water transfers. Back in January of 2017, the board guided us to aim to obtain the transfer water by December 2018, hopefully before then. So as you know, as of yesterday, December 3rd, we did open the valve from the city of Santa Cruz for the pilot test. And then this one here, secure agreements for treated effluent, secondary or tertiary with the city of Santa Cruz. The facility will not be treating raw wastewater. Again, I think when we first initiated on the advanced purification project, we were looking at two different types of source water, the raw sewage as well as treated secondary effluent. And so since that time over the, the years, we have made great strides in taking off the uh, untreated wastewater as a potential source and are focusing on um, getting uh, secondary water from Santa Cruz. Did you want to say something? Uh, I just say we have uh, draft uh, a letter and draft agreements for the uh, affluent, so we're well on our way there. So at this time, um, you know, the agenda staff memo is about 10 pages long that go through um, each of the water supply options. What we have here in our presentation tonight is about two slides per water supply option, focusing on the, the five or six water uh, qualities that the community has identified. So with Pure Water Soquel, first off, just in case there are those either watching on TV or in the public, um, this is our advanced water purification project where we would be taking treated secondary effluent from the city of Santa Cruz and uh, purifying that through a multiple step process, then delivering that water to uh, recharge wells to increase protective water levels as well as create a seawater barrier. Um, this project has been um, evaluating um, the feasibility of it since 2015. The board asked us to uh, really look into water quality, so we did commission uh, an independent panel under the National Water Research Institute. That panel convened in 2017 and concluded that the project is feasible and could produce safe uh, purified water from the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant. They also recommended that we do a pilot study, and as you can see th the picture on the right, we did conduct a pilot study this summer uh, to evaluate taking that water and treating it through um, microfiltration membranes. And currently, just as Ron mentioned, we are working quite diligently on um, creating a memorandum of understanding, or taking the memorandum of understanding that we have with the um, city of Santa Cruz and actually creating a memorandum of agreement to secure that water. In terms of the six qualities, um, in terms of reliability, we feel that that water still is and continues to be a reliable source. Uh, we would be taking about 25% of the over 8 million gallons of water that is sent out to the ocean. This still leaves ample amount of water should a future project by another entity ever want to do recycled water in the county. Uh, the water quality, of course, um, would have to meet regulatory requirements. These types of projects are permitted under the state. We would need to comply with that under the Title 22 and the regional board permits. And I, I'd just like to add um, that obviously the Orange County, which has been doing something similar for 40 plus years and the other entities, uh, their continual testing has shown that the water quality has exceeded or, you know, been better than what the state or federal requirements re uh, require. So it's proven. The project still meets the board's anticipated goal of having a project online. Uh, we have completed all of the feasibility. We've done the environmental work. Um, so we are on track if this project were to go forward uh, to be operational in by 2022. As noted there on the right, uh, the draft EIR was published in 2018. Uh, the findings of that report stated that except for noise during construction, all other potential significant environmental effects could be mitigated. We are currently working on responses to the comments. 
and, uh, and I'm hoping to publish a final EIR soon. The project could be scalable um, because of the way that the um, Pure Water Soak Health project could be designed. It, most of it is through membranes that could be built on skids. If the project were to be expanded, uh, we would need to do a subsequent environmental analysis on that. If the project were to be reduced, we could do that through operational flexibility. Um, for the Pure Water Soak Health project, um, we have done some cost estimating as recently as the 2017 feasibility study. And in Anoop's presentation, we'll go further into the cost um, analysis and estimates. Do you want to mention grant not funding on that? Sure. Um, thanks, Ron. Um, also to note, for the Pure Water Soak Health project, there is grant funding programs specifically that address uh, the objectives of this project. So the Title 16 program uh, that the Bureau has is specifically for recycled water projects, and also the Prop 1 groundwater grant through the state applies, this project would apply because of the seawater intrusion prevention barrier wells. In terms of water transfers, um, there has also been a considerable um, amount of work on this that we want to highlight. Um, the surface water transfer project would include taking excess treated water from the city of Santa Cruz and delivering it to the district uh, through the, our existing pipeline system. We currently have a pilot study that's been underway. The agreement was initiated in 2015. It was a five-year agreement for a small amount of water, approximately 300 acre feet to be uh, purchased from the water that is considered the North Coast sources or doesn't have water rights issues. Um, a lot of the testing and effort underway right now has to um, evaluate the water quality. This is not about the quantity that we're testing and evaluating right now, but it's really about the water quality, blending uh, surface water into a predominantly traditional groundwater system. We want to make sure that we've addressed any kind of water quality concerns that may come. In terms of the long-term project, um, that would be where we would purchase or buy uh, 1,500 acre feet of water from the city. Um, they are currently working a lot on the evaluation of their projects and programs under their efforts that they took when the desal project was put on hold. Um, that, that project uh, would require us to have a combination of water from North Coast as well as San Lorenzo River water. That water does have water rights issues, so that would need to be um, initiated. Right now, the city did put out uh, their environmental review process to have uh, their water rights go through an EIR. So the, uh, the city is watching, the district is watching that effort. We did provide comments and we foresee that once that process is completed and the water rights have uh, gone through CEQA and have been amended, then they would have to do subsequent environmental review on a project of that, of the long term. Yeah, and I'd like to point out the word potential there is not just because, you know, currently under the water rights it's not allowed and the feasibility study in the EIR that hasn't been completed or anything, but it, they're not even sure if they have the water. That's what another main problem because, you know, Santa Cruz is trying to solve its drought shortage problem. So after they get that done, whether there is available water is still yet to be determined. I just want to point out the picture on the right. Um, that is from yesterday's uh, valve turning of Ron and Rosemary. So it was an exciting day. <coughs> Again, looking at the water transfer project in terms of the qualities of our community, um, we do feel that the short-term project, pilot project, um, is reliable as long as we meet the conditions. There are a set of conditions that the city has in terms of if they can you know, provide us water. For the long-term reliability, I think you know um, it's it's under evaluation. The city is currently going through their feasibility. Their timeline um, is to better understand the amount of water that they could use and utilize for their projects, and then what they would need, what they could or or be able to share to neighboring agencies such as ourselves or Scotts Valley. Um, the amount of water that they could potentially share to us, and we'll go over that in, in a little bit more detail in a bit, um, is also contingent upon how much water they would want to um, uh, receive back. So um, still kind of, I think, um, some unknowns in terms of the reliability. 
For water quality, I think, um, of course, this is treated surface water from the city of Santa Cruz, so it would meet um, state and federal regulations. Um, in terms of timeliness, um, the short-term uh, pilot project will run through 2020. At this point, we don't know if that pilot project would be extended. Um, it could be extended for a, d a couple of years, perhaps, or we could ask that there be s um, s a, a long-term agreement made. In terms of the timeliness for the long term, um, I think for us at this point, it's best for us just to kind of acknowledge that it's unknown and dependent on the city's issues. I already addressed the environmental um, portions of the water transfer project. The short term project went through the initial study and, and negative deck, which was completed in 2016. If the project pilot project were to be extended, uh, that environmental analysis may need to be looked at again, especially if conditions are changed. So um, I just wanted to note that. And then in terms of the long term, I think, um, as, I, as Ron and I stated on the earlier slide, that effort is underway and we're just going to be watching uh, what kind of environmental impacts and analysis are determined from that effort. I think, weren't they saying that they potentially could start an EIR maybe at the end of 2020? Possibly, that so possibly. right so their their effort in terms of their feasibility and, and, and analysis on the the long term project for them uh, is to con complete all of the feasibility by 2020 bring it to the council that was what was on their timeline and then from 2020 they would initiate what what course of action they would do for their supply projects okay. whether or not they decide the they could I know um, Tom they could initiate a full EIR prior to that, um, but I think they it, it would be dependent on if they wanted to take that on. Um, the size of it, um, scalability, it's unknown. We don't know. There hasn't really been talk about how much water um, the city could provide to us. We do have some estimates that we've uh, used from the previous Kennedy Jenks report, and um, we'll go into that when the cost estimate. And again, the cost would be identified. Um, two more supply options within the community water plan. Um, this one is the deep water desal project. Um, this is a privately owned endeavor to develop a 25,000 acre foot per year desal project that would be coupled and co-located with a data center. Um, this would be in Moss Landing and the goal for it was to provide desalinated water to both Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. Um, the status update for the deep water desal project is that it has been underway um, since the m mid 2000s, 2010 or 2012, um, and they have been um, going through most of their efforts at this point <coughs> has been technical feasibility and environmental review. I'll hit these six qualities. So in terms of reliability, we do still feel that desalination water is a reliable source. There's ample amount of water out in the ocean. Again, this water, desalinated water, is permitted by the state of California, so the water that would be generated from this type of facility would, would meet or exceed um, state and federal regulations. In terms of timeliness, um, at this point it is unknown. We did um, get some information from the Deep Water Desal partners that their, on tr their timeline is to have the project online by 2023, assuming that they can get through all of their environmental and permitting. Um, I know in the past they've had some delays. Currently their environmental work was uh, a delay, but it's supposed to be released now. Um, as you can see on that next bullet, the environmental aspects of the project uh, is to release an EIR at the end of the third quarter. Um, at this point, once that comes out, we'll have a better idea of what the environmental impacts are for that project. In terms of scalability, um, there is potential for that. Currently, the way that the structure was uh, set up when the district board initiated a memorandum of interest in 2015 was that the uh, purchase of desalinated water would be at a take or pay. So we would, we would, we would negotiate or enter into an agreement that we would purchase you know, for, for our project, 1,500 acre feet per year, you would commit to that. Whether or not you actually took that uh, would be up to us, but we would pay for that 1,500 acre feet per year. 
Um, and then ag again, in terms of affordability and, af and um, affordable, that will be something uh, that a NOOP will address. For stormwater capture, um, this is our newest one and kind of our baby, I think, in terms of the water supply options since this is a more of a small scale uh, water supply projects that could be uh, developed or pursued to accompany one of the three that we just talked about. Um, this would be where we would capture available stormwater on site or perhaps near a storm drain and aid in the local recharge of the groundwater basin. The district um, has, has in, the, in the past year been working with several other agencies to identify locations where this would be feasible um, and really looked more at the aquifer conditions as well as water quality. So um, I think Shelley's group has done a lot of the work on this in terms of evaluating this and doing some on-site testing, again, with the folks from uh, the Denmark folks and doing a kind of a first flush first flush capture of water uh, to do some water quality sampling, um, working with Andy Fisher on identifying some sites, and I think recognizing again that these sites have the potential for about 10 to 50 acre feet per year for water captured, um, so it's about one tenth of the size of the project that we would need um, for, th for the whole district problem. Uh, one thing to note, I think, here, and, and Shelley did help me with uh, providing the information in the memo, is that a lot of the projects related to stormwater capture are dependent on landowner agreements. So in terms of the stormwater capture, in terms of the uh, qualities uh, that we've been looking at in terms of criteria, the reliability of this is somewhat unknown. It is dependent on rainfall and dependent on the rainfall reaching the, the aquifer units that would produce uh, you know, adequate or a volume of water that we could recharge. Um, in terms of water quality, as I mentioned, um, we did do some water quality sampling. It's very dependent on the runoff in that specific area. Our preliminary water quality testing identified several different compounds, um, pesticides, plasticizers, some oils. So the water that is being captured isn't really pristine um, that some people I think think of when they think about stormwater capture. In terms of timeliness, the exact timing is unknown for this project development. At this time, the projects don't really meet our needs, and um, the one area that we had identified as a potential site, which was near the golf course, with the recent land change ownership of that site, uh, this project really hasn't moved forward much. I know we will be continuing to talk to them, but timeliness is kind of still a factor. In terms of the environmental issues related to stormwater capture, they are unknown. The environmental work would need to be initiated once we did have a site and a project defined. Scalability and affordability, uh, both of these, um, there's just a lot of unknowns with stormwater capture. Uh, we recognized it when we were identifying it, and we still recognize that there's unknowns in terms of the size and the cost. At this point, um, I'd like to ask Anoop to come up. Um, Anoop will walk through. We know that um, the cost of a water supply project is very important. Uh, none of these projects are, are cheap. Um, I think developing a water supply project now anywhere, um, as, as we just came back from Aqua, um, cost millions of dollars. And so the, these projects that we've brought forward to you tonight and have been kind of um, captured in many different reports all have very different costs thrown about, uh, very s different assumptions, different years. And so Anoop's really going to kind of go into the method uh, that Brown and Caldwell did in terms of doing an updated cost analysis. Thanks, Melanie. Good evening, board members. Um, do you know how about five minutes time frame or what? I just want to understand good. the pace. Probably. So I'll go through the I'll go through the presentation relatively quickly, and then uh, if we need to, uh, I'll be available on the back end to answer any questions. So just a quick overview of the presentation, and I'll um, I'll walk through each. Uh, wanted to go over the objective and the background that uh, the objective of the study or the analysis that I performed. Uh, what is the background, the approach we used. And then really this uh, particular aspect, we focused on the three options, the river water transfer options, the purified recycled water, uh, or the pure water SoCal option, 
and the deep water desal. Uh, when we wrote the memo that's in your package, uh, we had not received the information from deep water desal, uh, but uh, just the, I think the evening we completed the memo, we got an email from deep water desal with updated information. So I've captured that in this presentation, so I'll be able to provide that update. So really, um, the, the objective over here was to give you an, um, uh, a way to do apples to apples comparison. You know, district has done many studies over the years. Uh, several studies were done in 2013, 2017, 18, and each study presented a different basis for the cost. And really what Melanie asked me to do is while uh, she was putting together uh, the update for the board, she said, well, can we do a more uh, bring parity between all these numbers so board can actually evaluate or look at these numbers more on the apple to apple. So um, the focus of th this analysis was to just bring parity between the different studies and numbers. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, several uh, options were evaluated in the community water uh, plan. As Melanie mentioned, uh, stormwater capture was probably the one option that did not meet the entire demand of 1,500 acre feet per year. It only provided a small fraction. So we, I, in this effort, we didn't look at the stormwater capture or updating those costs. There are not any costs available to go by. It was very much variable on the land availability, landowner size of the project. So we just focused on the, the three elements there, uh, the transfer, pure water SoCal, and deep water desal. So, as I mentioned, uh, various reports or studies that uh, have provided different costs, bits and pieces of costs, and the definition. Um, the, the st these are the studies or the reports that I've used in the analysis today. Uh, going from left to right, uh, the first two are uh, what the source is coming from city of Santa Cruz. The first one is their Prop 218 study. Um, that's what they've used to establish the water rates. And then the other study is the 2013 st study that looked into the feasibility of uh, bringing the San Lorenzo River tr transfer, what would it take to take it through Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant and um, uh, have that water available. So we've used that, uh, those two studies from the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, then of course the 2017 study, Carollo Feasibility Study, looking at pure water SoCal and then the email that I mentioned about uh, deep water desal. So those are the bases that I've used for updating the costs. Anoop, can I just also sure. add, you know, um, as we worked on the, the development of these costs, and I think that was great that you showed the email from um, deep water desal, the, the sources that we used for the city of Santa Cruz, that KJ report was one that one, we, we've been working with staff, they asked us to use that, the staff from the city asked us to use that one. So city has mentioned that, yeah, you can use the values um, from that study. And in fact, some of the more recent uh, numbers that have been cited in the media from the city staff have referred back to the same study. So that's the basis for it. Um, you know, before I jump into the costs, I wanted to just give you a quick background. Most of the studies, most of the reports were conceptual level or planning level. And with the planning level, the definition of the design is uh, whether it's 5% or 10%, and with that definition comes the range. So uh, any numbers that you see in the analysis, just use that, keep this perspective. Mostly the, the midpoint of the estimate is presented, but there's always the range. There's always some level of uh, range on the cost, given the level at which these um, studies were done. So. Um, for example, 2017 study uh, for Pure Water SoCal, it cited, uh, it was feasibility study and the, it was a class four estimate uh, for the cost. So that has an accuracy range uh, that's been highlighted. Just to keep that uh, perspective um, as we get into the numbers. All right, so th maybe some of this might look familiar. Back in May, uh, we had a board meeting and we talked about the numbers that were reported for Pure Water SoCal, and those were 2017. Well, guess what? When we have to actually pay the bills for any facility construction, that's at the time of the construction. So we really should th also think about uh, when the time of the construction or having the facilities online, what would be the actual cost? And, and that's where this idea comes in is, let's take those uh, numbers that were presented in different studies and apply the right amount of escalation to bring the cost at the midpoint of construction or at the time of the construction. So that's the idea behind this. Um, 
the background or the analysis we have done is we've taken the numbers that were presented in 2014 or 16 or 17, and we've escalated them to 2022. That's the time frame that we are looking at for Pure Water SoCal, and we felt that was a good uh, milestone to c bring the parity or compare the costs. Um, we did some analysis about uh, what has been the escalation in the region, and we looked at uh, uh, data that's been presented by um, several different agencies, and all of this data seemed to point uh, escalation anywhere in the range of three to six percent, maybe seven percent, is more prevalent in the area. Uh, from the ENR engineer, um, engineering news and record uh, standpoint, they recommend this area to be treated as the San Francisco, Greater San Francisco Bay Area, and we've used the escalation that's provided in that area uh, for updating the costs. Um, this has been the number that uh, City of San Francisco or SFPUC has been using, and um, their recommendation for escalation in 2019 is 6%. What we have done is, just for a simplification of approach, we've used just 5% escalation across the board. So we applied 5% escalation on all studies uh, to bring the cost to parity. So let's get into the actual options. So that was all the background. Um, as Melanie mentioned, the short-term pilot was only for 2015 and 2020. Even yesterday, uh, uh, City of Santa Cruz representative cited that the, the money or the value of water um, that uh, district is being charged for that research project is a research project only. It cannot be treated or used for long-term usage. But just for you know, comparison purposes and give you a, a data point, uh, what we have done is we've used that Prop 218 study that City of Santa Cruz charges their own customers for the water rates. And just to give you a range, the left-hand column, single family residential um, unit, that's a tier one rate. The rate at which uh, they charge their own customers, it's about, um, from the acre feet, uh, dollar per acre foot standpoint is about $5,200 per acre foot. That's on the s tier one residential customer. District based, if district were to continue down this path, if this study were to be continued for beyond 2022, again, this is speculation, but district would probably classify as more of a commercial user or uh, more of a wholesaler type. And the current rate that's published in the uh, uh, Prop 218 study, it's about um, $14 per cubic you know, uh, unit, or it come out, comes out to be about $6,200 uh, per acre foot. There might be an opportunity to renegotiate these rates if this study were to continue or this pilot were to continue, but I wanted to uh, at least provide these numbers. We haven't used this beyond. I think for long-term comparison purposes, we are going into um, the San Lorenzo River, this is the 2013 study uh, that we are talking about. And the published number in 2013 U.S. dollars were about $7,400 uh, per acre foot or uh, for option four, which was increasing Graham Hill uh, water treatment plant capacity or scenario five, which would have been uh, some capacity increase in the treatment, and that was about in the range of 3,900. So this gives you a pretty wide spectrum of anywhere from 3,900 to $7,400 uh, dollars per acre foot in 2013 U.S. dollars, and if we escalate that, um, the numbers come out to be significantly higher, anywhere from 11,000 to 6,100. So keep these numbers in perspective as we go through this option. The next one I will talk about is Pure Water Soquel. Pure Water Soquel, based on 2017 study, um, uh, we're, we're looking at alternatives. There were several alternatives within there, but this was probably right in the middle of the pack alternative in terms of the cost. That comes out to be about $2,700 per acre foot. That's in 2017 U.S. dollars. So if we escalate those to 2020, um, that comes out to be anywhere from $4,600 per acre foot. So that gives you a perspective of, um, in the 2022 standpoint, comparing to river water option versus pure water Soquel, uh, where the costs come out to be. I had a question. <coughs> I had a question. Sure. Did, were you including the funding, potential funding in that? No, this is, this is uh, without the funding. So this is 
all the costs being paid for uh, by the district through either the loans or, or um, uh, some kind of bonds. Okay. So any, any f additional funding or grant money that you receive, that would even, in, in theory, reduce the costs. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, a fresh uh, off the press uh, email that we received um, uh, about the deep water desal. Uh, there are two elements to it. The way the deep water desal facility is being built, um, the costs that r they, they reported were uh, at the fence line. So they will do the treatment, they'll do the brine discharge, all that stuff. And if you were to pick up the water at their facility, this is what they would charge you. Uh, that's 1900 to $2,300 uh, per acre foot. Then district would be responsible for building a new pipeline from Moss Landing location all the way to our connection point. And the 2014 study that was done for deep water diesel that estimated about $33 million for that pipeline costs. The way uh, the system works, I think it's important to note uh, the, the unit cost for treatment, that's just a pay-go. For every acre foot of water you buy, you have to pay that much money. There's no grants available. There are no loans available. It has to be paid for by the, by the rates. And the infrastructure cost that we are talking about, $33 million, when you escalate that out to 2022, that's a substantially high cost, about $49 million. Uh, in, at the time of construction, plus it's also not eligible for Prop 1 grants. You know, remember we talked about the window of opportunity. Right now, uh, district has a unique window of opportunity to secure Prop 1 funding, some of the grant. Um, those will not be available for deep water diesel, just purely from the timing standpoint. And uh, another important point that Melanie was talking about, this is a fairly large project. I think it's about 25,000 acre feet per year with several different entities playing their part to make, make it come to fruition. So are there other external factors that might be implementation of this project? There has been some delays on the environmental side as we, uh, we understand or the communication between deep water desal um, and, uh, and other agencies. And maybe you know the environmental compliance of uh, that facility might continue to cause some some delay. So I, I wanted to bring the six icons that Melanie referred to in her presentation. And the way I, I would stack those up uh, here is uh, I think the water uh, quality and quantity is great. I think the facility is scalable, but where the deep water desal option um, is not so cer on a strong footing is. Um, the environmental compliance, the timing of it, and the, the actual cost that would be incurred by the district to um, make uh, use of this project. So with, with that, I think um, I wanted to focus on just these uh, elements, the, the river water transfers and the pure water soquel. I think those are the two viable alternatives, so to speak, that meets district's need for 1,500 acre feet per year and also uh, potentially the timing uh, again, uh, from looking at the, just the capital cost uh, impact, this is how the numbers stack up um, at the 5% escalation standpoint. And if I were to compare them on unit cost per acre foot, you're looking at the bottom line of the table. Uh, the two options um, for the long-term San Lorenzo River water transfer, they range from 11000 to 6000 dollars per acre foot, and the pure water SoCal comes out to be about 4,600 in 2022 dollars standpoint. I think this is the last slide I have. Um, yeah, I, I would just, uh, you know, just a quick reminder about things. With pure water SoCal being a project that district may undertake, that would be a district project, it becomes available, um, uh, it is uh, available for receiving grant funding, as well as um, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for district to substantially reduce the cost of that project. Um, there's also the timing element that Melanie has talked about. Uh, any delays on the timing of any other alternatives, you'd continue to have the inflation aspect. So if you're looking at anywhere from $90 million to $100 million project, there's also the issue of grants with respect to delays. delays. You might not be able to get a grant, and even if you got a grant, there are d limits on how quickly, how 
l late you can build with them. So if you can't be timely, then you could that end up not having a grant. At all. That's exactly right. So you covered my last bullet over there, window of opportunity about the grants. Mm -hmm. So if there's any delay, that uh, window of opportunity closes down in terms of the grants as well. So I would, uh, you know, again, recap these numbers. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this element. And then, um, Melanie, you wanted to yeah. summarize? I think just one other thing on this slide previously related to other funding considerations. We did talk about, you know, oh, should we also include in this analysis at this time exactly what um, Director Lather asked in terms of grant. So should we have different grant scenarios? If we had different funding, what would the unit cost be of Pure Water Soquel? Um, what about the uh, other projects such as the river water transfer desal, which um, it's my understanding from uh, conversations with Leslie, if we do a, if we do a, a water supply project option or we pursue something where we're purchasing water, we really that really does impact. I think one grants we don't we can't get a grant for purchasing water, and two I think it does affect how we're able to. Uh, to fund that because it's not a capital asset. So that that does change things in terms of how we go about our financial books. So those are some things. And, and there was a lot already to chew on, and so we just presented this. If you guys would like us to come back to do those different scenarios, we could do that. Um, but just in closing, I think, Anup, can you hit that last slide? Um, Really, again, I think tonight's presentation was to give an up-to-date snapshot. We've, we've presented a lot of this information before. Men, much, some of it is not new. It's been to different board meetings and different standing committee meetings. Some of the information was new as we've been working with Deepwater Desal and the city of Santa Cruz. And I think the big thing is some of this stuff, we still have lots of unknowns, and we recognize some of these are unknowns. The stormwater capture project is, is one example as a whole water supply option. There's still a lot of things that we don't know. In terms of the surface water projects and the opportunities with the city of Santa Cruz, I think as they go forward with their evaluation, we'll continue to get more information. At this point, what we've done is looked upon the best available data that's out there now and what they feel comfortable with us sourcing. So I know that there's still a lot of you know scenarios that could be out there with surface water transfers, but this at this point, this snapshot is what the city has asked us to kind of look at to create some parity in terms of cost. And I think one last thing to add is that um, as you can see in those scenarios with the city of Santa Cruz's water supply options, you know, one of them was about 800 acre feet, one was a little bit over almost 1,200 acre feet. These all have varying degrees of water availability, the quantity. We kind of know what we need in terms of our water supply. So this could be, as, as Ron always talks about too, um, our solution could be um, multiple projects. It could be one project. I think what we're looking at it right now is that this is an and, not an or, and that's the information we really wanted to try to convey tonight. And most importantly, I think for us going forward from, you know, special projects and developing and evaluating these uh, these components within the community water plan, on a technical level. The other side um, in my department is also education and outreach. So we want to make sure that we're providing this information out to the public and not just getting it in front of the board and those who come to the meeting. Thank you very much to those who come to the meeting. But we also need to get it out to the general public. And so we would like to make sure that the information gets transmitted to our channels such as the eblast. Uh, future newsletters. Uh, we may do uh, another mailing on this, but we want to try and get this information out. Yeah, and if I may I just add to that, you know, sitting in my seat, I, I get, you know, people saying you should do only D cell, that's the way to go, there's an ocean pool of water, or river water is, you know, the best, or, you know, recycle, why wouldn't you recycle water if you have it versus, you know, take from somewhere else? And, you know, and although we're comparing here, again, if we think about the aquifer in terms of sustainability and reliability, and of course, there's financial implications and stuff, but really, you know, your best bet is uh, not to put all your eggs in one basket. So you, maybe you have a, a, a main thrust, but if you can also do uh, other to some extent, whether it's um, some, some amount of uh, recycled water or river water in addition or a little bit of uh, storm water, you're hedging your bets 
for uh, water security in the future. So I just don't like it when people pit one against the other, and we're not trying to do that here. We're just trying to put the relativity out there as we move forward. Yes, I'd like to add one thing. As some of you may know that I've had some concerns about, you know, in a drought, if we were dependent on surface water, um, we wouldn't get much of it, and it, there wouldn't be much rain, so there's not much recharge going on, and we would have to supply water for our customers, and the city would need their 1.2 billion gallons to make up for their customers, so there'd be a lot of water going out and not much going in. And, in fact, uh, the agency meeting uh, last month, the city... Uh, contribute some documents to that and there's a great sentence in there which I find scary it says some modeling results presented to the Advisory Committee indicated water levels in key monitoring wells dropping below protective elevations during periods of drought withdrawals so again if you de just are dependent on surface water that could be a problem so having something like a pure water so that you can at least have something going into the aquifer while all this is getting taken out, may be the only thing that makes it work at all. Right, not just for us. Not just for us, right, exactly. As much as I love stormwater recharge, that goes with that too. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions from board members? Any, any questions from members of the public or comment? Thank you, Anoop. Thank you, Anoop. Thank you, Anoop. Thank you, Anoop. Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos, thank you for all of that good information. Um, I have a lot of questions and a lot of comments, and I just want to again say that it seems to me that the game has become to make sure you get the grant. And I feel like your board has lost sight of the goal that is stated on your, um, your website that you will provide water in an environmentally sensitive way and be economically responsible. I think this Pure Water Soquel is very expensive. I think you are really underestimating the value and the potential of the water transfers and of a good regional solution working together cooperatively with Santa Cruz City. I think that um, you need to be looking at, I, I see these costs per acre feet, but they're, they're conceptual too, because you really haven't sat down at the table with Santa Cruz City and worked out maybe an agreement that whatever you do is also going to benefit them, because they've got the belts 12 wells in this aquifer too. And if, while I hear that um, water transfers are not eligible for Prop 1 grants because there's no capital asset, what if you offered to help subsidize the cost of capital assets improvements within Santa Cruz City's system to increase the amount of water that this district could get from that agency? And then you would have a stake in that, and those those improvements could be eligible for grants. So there are creative ways to get grants for water transfers. If you're willing to sit down at the table and, and think outside the box and work in a regional way. I also feel like these costs per acre feet do not really um, take into account the land purchases that you're entering into now with the lamb family the free water for 50 years at a recharge well for the church. They do not consider the $2.5 million increase per year estimated in your own information of operating costs for Pure Water SoCal. So these are false numbers. They do not really give a clear picture what the cost and the affordability of this water is going to be. Your rates are already second highest in the state for a system your size. And you're looking at your increasing your rates 9% a year Thank for you. a number of years. Thank you, Becky. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak on this Thank you. I, I mean, there are just so many people waiting to talk. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. 
Seeing none, that was informational only. Enough. Did your numbers contain operations and maintenance uh, figures, or was this just uh, construction? No, I think included both. We even escalated uh, the annualized cost that took into consideration the operation cost. Good. Thank you. That's what I thought. President LeCue. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. No. But I was, we were working with a little tape recorder at the beginning of the meeting. Was there an announcement that the closed session I did. Resulted, yes, did you? I did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I missed that, and so did him. It was quick, okay. but it was done. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go on to the next item, which is water supply disinfection and disinfection byproducts. Which was something requested by Jaffe, who I know not to be here. Yeah. Yes, and he's not here. I'll let him know that uh, it's online yeah. for you to, for him okay. to look at. Okay. Right. And it was, you know, a good report. Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, so um, he requested a, a description of our disinfection process, and uh, the district uses what we call breakpoint chlorination for uh, disinfecting the water coming from all of our wells. Um, and we use sodium hypochlorite, which is um, bleach, basically. Um, it's about twice as strong as your regular household bleach. Um, and we also use that to oxidize the iron and manganese in the wells that we do treat for iron and manganese to allow uh, to filter um, the iron and manganese out. Um, we measure the chlorine residual at w each well head and that um, gets sent to SCADA so we can monitor that remotely. Um, wells will shut down um, automatically if there is something wrong with the disinfection process. Um, we have operators going out uh, about four times a week that check the monitors and do hand readings in the field um, and do calibration of the uh, analyzers. Um, we also monitor the residual and the distribution system weekly at 16 rotating locations. Um, the attachment uh, one includes our uh, the, the last report to the state on our disinfectant residual monitoring. Um, the maximum allowable limit for uh, free chlorine or total chlorine is four parts per mil million. Um, our average uh, is about 0 0.72, which is about exactly where we want it at. Um, and then we also quarterly monitor for disinfection byproducts in the distribution system and attachment two includes our last report. Um, these uh, include haloacidic acids and trihalomethanes, um, and we're generally about half of the MCL for the THMs and pretty low on the um, haloacidic acids. Um, yeah. The water transfer uh, that just started yesterday, we're going to be closely monitoring the, the THM and HAA5 levels. Um, in the distribution system because the city has higher concentrations than we do. Um, and so we'll be, we're monitoring every two weeks for those. And just the question, is that mostly because of the increased organic matter in surface water? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, and probably we won't know the uh, worst case basis for the taking the city water until next year when we open it up to all of service area and service area surface areas one and two because the water age is older in the upper reaches of our uh, system and the the phase one the the zone that we're testing out right now doesn't have that old of water so we're probably not going to see the worst case this winter mm -hmm. so we'll have to wait for next winter to see how high they actually go any okay. questions? I noticed they also have a slightly higher uh, chlorine levels too, so mm -hmm. that can factor in. Yes, they do. Thanks for doing that analysis about the import yeah, too. Yeah, it was really interesting. Thank you. We had a lot of questions. I think some part of this came up from uh, Dr. Jaffe was about uh, people were concerned about the chlorine, chlorine, test. mm -hmm. chlorine testing and just my uh, customers were, and uh, I didn't have the answers for them, so I. I've Xeroxed the, now I've downloaded the article, oh, okay. and I going back to that address. And you know, oh, good. Get a chance. Okay. So, yeah, it's great to have that resource and know that it's significantly below the MCL. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any questions mm -hmm. or comments from the public on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to scheduling ethics training. 
Good evening, board. Um, as you know, you participate, the board um, is state mandated to participate in um, ethics training uh, every two years. And we're coming up on our two year schedule. We've been doing this since 2005 when the law was enacted. Um, so we'd like to discuss some training opportunities. I do wanna make a couple of corrections on the dates that were proposed in the memo. Um, they should read January 15th and February 5th. I must not have been wearing my glasses when I made those typos. So my apologies for that. Um, uh, Bob Basso, the uh, board's um, district council, um, has, um, is a qualified trainer and has been conducting our training and so we wanted to open it up for the board to discuss when you'd like to schedule that training. Either of those works for me. Yep. January's fine. February's better for me if everything's is good it? for you. Okay. Yeah, either one was fine with me. As long as it's not during the day. Mm -hmm. No, it's <laughs> usually at the beginning of a meeting. Five starting o'clock works for you. Yeah. Director Laker. It is required two hour uh, training, so it would, it would require a pushback on the start date of our regular or start time of our regular meeting as well. If we started at five. Uh, no, the regular meeting would start at seven. Correct. So it's five to seven for the ethics and then seven to. Correct. Yeah. I, I meant it would push back our normal start time of yes. our regular meeting. Right. So. Right. Are there any um, staff considerations for like agendas? Because uh, it's typically nice to have it on a day when you, you know, if you do two hours of training, not to have a three hour agenda yeah, after that. Yeah, I don't think the uh, early February is, is stacked too heavily. Did you take a glance at that? Um, I did not take yeah, a look I at that, but that I do know that we are um, considering uh, uh, canceling our January that meeting, so we'd only have one January meeting, mm -hmm. which could stack up January a little February bit. Would definitely or would probably be better, better that way. Yeah, it sounds okay. like Mr. Basso would prefer that. Okay. Any, any other conflicts we know of? Okay, I'll make a motion that it, we have the uh, tra ethics training on uh, February 5th. Second. The day after I turned yeah. 65. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. Poor guy. <laughs> Mere child. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's been on the board longer than you've been alive on that. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Okay. Thank did, you. Did, did someone second it? I did. You did. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Hopefully that works for Director Jaffe. Um, the next one was just the summer meeting schedule. Yeah, and so what we're recommending is, is basically what we do each year is uh, cancel the first meeting in July and the first meeting in August. So that cancel the July 2nd meeting and the August mm -hmm. 6th meeting. Works fine. Yeah. Anybody? Works for me. Okay, any public comment on that? No? I'll motion. make the motion then. Go make the motion. Mm -hmm. I okay. just did. Emma, did you get that moved and seconded? Okay. Right. Oh, she's quick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And then January. Yeah. So the uh, January meeting would fall on January 1st, which um, is yeah. a New Year's holiday. And we're requesting directors from, from the board whether they'd like to cancel this meeting or not. We've traditionally done it in the past because it's been so close to the holiday. I'll make that motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That is that carries as well. Um, I think we are. Let's make sure I haven't forgotten anything. No written communications, and we already dealt with that. So the meeting is now adjourned until December 18th. Yep. Thank you very much.